Unit Five, Gateway. Human beings do not enter the world as competent moral agents, nor does everyone leave the world in that state. But somewhere in between, most people acquire a bit of decency that qualifies them for membership in the community of moral agents. Genes, development, and learning all contribute to the process of becoming a decent human being. The interaction between nature and nurture is, however, highly complex, and developmental biologists are only just beginning to grasp just how complex it is. Without the context provided by cells, organisms, social groups, and culture, DNA is inert. Anyone who says that people are genetically programmed to be moral has an oversimplified view of how genes work. Genes and environment interact in ways that make it nonsensical to think that the process of moral development in children or any other developmental process can be discussed in terms of nature versus nurture. Developmental biologists now know that it is really both, or nature through nurture. A complete scientific explanation of moral evolution and development in the human species is a very long way off. Exercise one: Finding an ideal location for a piano is often difficult. In the order of importance, the location should help preserve the instrument, be acoustically satisfactory, and be aesthetically pleasing. Ideally, a piano should be placed on an inside wall, away from the direct rays of the sun. Moreover, it should not be placed next to heaters, stoves, air conditioners, or near heat ducts or cold air returns. Drafty locations next to open windows or doors should also be avoided. Instruments that are placed directly beneath water pipes or emergency sprinkler systems should be protected with a waterproof cover from possible water damage. Finding the best location for a piano also includes acoustical considerations. Usually, a piano sounds best in a room without thick wall-to-wall -wall carpeting or heavy sound-absorbing draperies. Exercise two. Power. Considered by some theorists to be the entrance requirement for anger, is not necessary for sadness. Anger is an approach emotion, while sadness is a retreat emotion. Thinking of a person as sad makes us see them as weaker and more submissive. Anger, not sadness, is associated with controlling one's circumstances, such as competition, independence, and leadership. Anger, not sadness, is linked to assertiveness, persistence, and aggressiveness. Anger, not sadness, is a way to actively make change and confront challenges. Anger, not sadness, leads to perceptions of higher status and respect. Like happy people, angry people are more optimistic, feeling that change is possible and that they can influence outcomes. Sad and fearful people tend toward pessimism. Feeling powerless to make change. Exercise three. Sadly enough, some of us have distorted lessons of happiness that developed in our childhood. Our experiences developed as we grew up in different systems, such as our original family, our religious community, and our neighborhood. Many of us believe that only a few of us experience true happiness. Most believe attaining true happiness is like winning the lottery. And only some of us are lucky enough to win it, or maybe some of us believe in works of righteousness, a theology that says if you work hard enough at anything, you will receive what you work for. Any one of these theories of happiness is born of the philosophy that happiness is scarce. Looking around our world right now, I would have to agree that true happiness is in short supply. But this is because we have bought into a belief system that teaches us that happiness is as scarce as exercise for. The causes and consequences of war may have more to do with pathology than with politics, more to do with irrational pressures of pride and pain than with rational calculations of advantage and profit. There is a Washington story, perhaps apocryphal, that the military intellectuals in the Pentagon conducted an experiment in which they fed data derived from the events of the summer of 1914 into a computer 
and that after weighing and digesting the evidence, the machine assured its users that there was no danger of war. What this proves, if anything, is that computers are more rational than men. It also suggests that if there is a root cause of human conflict and of the power drive of nations, it lies not in hopes of economic development, historical forces, or the workings of the balance of power, but in the ordinary hopes and fears of the human mind. Unit five, gateway.